Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. We're just going to give it maybe one or two more minutes to let people um, enter the webinar before we get started. Um, but we're really excited to have you all here and we'll be starting shortly. Okay, well, good afternoon, good evening, hopefully not good morning for most people here. Um, welcome to the Best Practices for the Advancement and Inclusion of Women in STEM and National Security webinar series presented by CRDF Global's Women in Science Security Initiative. This first segment of the webinar series will focus on CRDF Global's recently published Best Practices Guide written by Kate Hewitt, Sylvia Mishra, and myself. Um, founded in 1995, CRDF Global is an independent nonprofit organization that promotes international scientific and technical collaboration through grants, resources, trainings, and services. Originating in Arlington, Virginia, with growing offices in the Eurasia and MENA regions, CRDF Global works with more than 40 countries in the Middle East, North Africa, Eurasia, Asia, and the Western Hemisphere. CRDF Global's Women in Science and Security team is an initiative to support and spearhead equity efforts for women around the world, including subject matter experts, professors, and leaders. Our efforts have included events such as Breaking Barriers, which I'll speak about later, webinars, and publications such as the Best Practices Guide that we will be discussing today. And before passing it off to our moderator, uh, Marian Finocchiaro, I'd also like to give a short introduction for her. Uh, Marian works as a trial and logistics coordinator for the IVLP portfolio at CRDF Global and has a background in international law, human rights, and international exchange. Marian is excited to have the opportunity to collaborate with the Women in Science and Security Initiative at CRDF Global to facilitate this webinar and future events with the goal of promoting the voices of women and IVLP alumni in STEM and national security. Off to you, Marian. Thanks for the introduction, Kimmy. Um, so there will be a 10 to 15 minute question and answer session after the discussion of each chapter for participants to be able to engage with the panelists. Uh, please note that you can type your questions into the Q&A chat box at any time. We will record the questions and present them during each Q&A session. We simply request that if you would like to direct a question to a specific speaker, please indicate that in your question. As Kimmy mentioned, I will be serving as your moderator today and we're joined by some very ex exciting speakers for this session. Today we'll be hearing from two co-authors of the Best Practices Guide, as well as two International Visitor Leadership Program alumna who are working in STEM fields in Ecuador and Panama. Without further ado, I will begin by introducing our IVLP alumna guests. Um, Dr. Patricia Castillo-Briseno, is an Ecuadorian scientist with a specialty in animal biomedicine. She is a principal professor of physiology at ULAM University in Ecuador and a 2017 alumna of the U.S. Department of State IVLP Hidden No More project. She is also a proud co-founder of the Ecuadorian Network of Women in Science and is committed to promoting diversity in STEM and to reducing the gender gap in academia. 
Also with us today is Dr. Ivan Torres Atencio, the Director of the Department of Pharmacology and the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Panama. Dr. Torres Atencio is a founding member of the science movement in Panama beginning in 2016 with numerous research articles detailing her work. She is also a 2018 alumna of the U.S. Department of State's IVLP Hidden No More program. We look forward to the discussion today with both of you, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about your experiences and your work. Um, we were connected with both of these wonderful IVLP alumna throughout, through the International Visitors Council of Los Angeles. IVCLA is a nonprofit organization dedicated to people-to-people -to -people international exchange programs, including the U.S. Department of State's International Visitor Leadership Program. IVCLA puts international influencers and LA area innovators together to tackle global issues, creating dialogue that would not otherwise be possible. We'd like to thank them for partnering with us on this event, and we look forward to continued collaboration in the future. We also have two of the Best Practices Guide authors with us. Uh, first off is Ms. Sylvia Mishra. Sylvia leads the CBRN, that stands for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Working Group for Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, and she is also a mid-career cadre scholar at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Sylvia has held fellowships at numerous well-known organizations, such as New America and the Nuclear Threat Initiative and she worked in New Delhi at the Observer Research Foundation on India-U.S. defense and security ties. Sylvia has numerous publications, such as book chapters and opinion pieces, and is currently pursuing her doctoral studies. Um, last but not least, uh, we have my colleague and also a co-author of the Best Practices Guide, Ms. Kimmy Ma, who is a project associate at CRDF Global. Kimmy first came to CRDF um, as a health and biosecurity intern in 2019. Prior to her current role, she conducted research at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute and Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. During college, she served as the senior coordinator for the Women in Science Project um, peer mentoring program, and Kimmy, Kimmy currently leads and manages the Women in Science and Security initiative that brings you this webinar today. Um, so welcome everyone, we're so glad to have you here and I can't wait to hear um, what you have to say. Um, so we're going to be diving into the content of the best practices guide shortly, but before we do, uh, could you each please tell us a little bit about yourselves, your work, and how you first became involved in your industry or field. Um, let's start with you, Patricia. Yeah. Hi, uh, hello everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's really, really a pleasure to be here and sharing this morning here with all of you. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. So um, just telling uh, a bit about how was my, my path on STEM. Uh, I'm a marine biologist at the beginning of the career, and also I was very lucky to have some role models at home. So this is an example. Uh, my mother, she's a biochemistry. And she was very um, dedicated to areas of microbiology in the mostly in food industry. Um, her, uh, I'm not in the field of industry now, I'm more on research. Um, but however, it was good to have a woman in science at home. So it was really inspiring. And then I decided to go um, doing marine biology. It was uh, very excited about the sea, about the, the turtles, the marine iguana, the whale, you know, every animals there in the sea and um, uh, starting the career first concerned with issues related to the environmental health. I was, uh, I made my, my project for the finish of the, of the degree, uh, working on a monitoring on microbiological parameters in areas that were relevant in the terms of the ecological aspects for biodiversity, but also for artists and fisheries. And going more on health, I was getting more, um, more related to going more in the, in the research on how the ecosystems are working and how the health of the species is related to the health of the environment. Um, suddenly, I have the opportunity to go in a volunteering work on the Charles Darwin Foundation in Galapagos Islands, and I was working there with Marine Iwana. 
And that was really a, an opening mind because I was first doing like that kind of going on some research, but there was like a lot of international environment, a lot of researchers for around the world working in very exciting uh, environments. So I decided like, I really want to pursue that career. You know, it's not just to be a uh, marine biologist and doing that, but really doing research and generating knowledge. So I decided to go on my, my master's degree and then I got a, a fellowship in Spain doing uh, my PhD on immunology in fish, going more in an evolutionary approach. And taking that, there was another way to assess the health, relating again the health of the environment and the health of the animals. This time, more at the molecular level, that was the tools. But actually, it was very open, open in the mind because uh, we start to see how, for me, it was like very open in the mind and the, um, to see how connected are we in all the animals at the molecular and, ce and cellular levels, you know, the, at the inside, we are very the same. Like maybe outside we are humans or you have cats, you have fish, but in the inside we have a lot in common. Uh, so I, uh, I was really, really excited about finding new molecules, actually how one, one, one new variant of a molecule on my own and founding new functioning for other uh, molecules, in example, for collagen, that is mainly thought is an, a molecule more relevant for structural issues. But actually, I found that it was able to regulate their immunitarian response across different species. And then going on until now that I'm back in Ecuador, uh, I made well in the, between my PhD and coming here to Ecuador. I was also in France doing my postdoc, working with the frogs, also another model that inside is the same than us. And uh, coming back to Ecuador was the idea to applying all that knowledge of that fields on the STEM and taking back to my country, make the transference of science, also making more diffusion in science and promoting science and technology in, in Ecuador by 2014 particularly applying that approach on molecular, on cellular, on physiological approach for assessing how uh, factors related to climate change are affecting the physiology of these species, but now with native species in Ecuador. So basically that will be in summary. I think we can talk more a little bit later on how it was the path like, to finally arrive here. Thank you so much, Patricia. It's really great to hear about your professional journey and um, you've done so much and kind of, um, it seems like you're finding your passions and kind of narrowing down what you're working on. So it's really awesome to hear about your journey. Um, I'm going to turn it over to um, Yvonne and let her tell us about um, her own professional journey as well. Hello, everybody. It's a really honor to be here. Um, I'm pharmacist, my bachelor. Um, during my, my degree, I started my thesis program or project on the Department of Pharmacology. And my mentor, a woman, really inspired me about, you know, technician and how to um, discover drugs, how the drugs works in our body. And that's inspired me too much. So as soon as I finished my, uh, my degree, I was uh, invited to, to start my, all my professor career in the University of Panama. So I started by assistant professor, and a couple of years later, I started my master's degree. And uh, when just finally my master's degree, I already had two kids. <laughs> and uh, I, won, I won a fellowship to my PhD degree. And I fly to, I traveled to Barcelona, Spain, and uh, started my PhD degree in pharmacology in the University of Autonomous of Barcelona uh, during four years. Uh, basically, working in uh, asthma and uh, all immunological response in respiratory tract. After that time, I returned to Panama to do it as well, Patricia transferred the knowledge, transferred the techniques uh, and uh, share with other colleagues in my department. And uh, after all this time, I now I'm professor and general lecturer, kind of in US. And 
But now I made a lot of research, uh, collaboration, plus divulgation of science and working with uh, more mentoring and trying to inspire young women in science. This is basically my, my journey. Thank you so much. Um, also really inspiring to hear about your journey as well. Um, you both are doing amazing work and we'll get to hear a little bit more about what you're working on um, later in the webinar. Um, for now, I'm gonna turn to Sylvia and let her tell us a little bit about what she's been working on and how she um, came to be where she's at now. Hi everyone, my name is Sylvia Mishra and I'm a researcher. My a PhD is on uh, the intersection of nuclear weapons and emerging technologies and how that changes the balance of power in conflictual diets like the United States and China and China and India. So I also lead the uh, WCAP CBRN uh, working group where we try to uh, spotlight and highlight the work in WMD sector of women of color and very recently I have uh, become a part of uh, the Indian Women in International uh, Relations. That is a group uh, that we have recently started to underscore and highlight the work of Indian women in international relations and national security issues. So as much as I'm uh, heavily invested and interested in expanding and strengthening gender equities in the national policy, uh, sector, I am also uh, keenly interested in understanding how uh, women can uh, play a more important role and expand their participation in STEM fields. And this is uh, why um, this is a uh, study that Kimi, uh, Kate and myself undertook uh, to uh, do uh, this uh, CRDF uh, report. I have, um, I have always uh, been interested in national uh, security and policy issues. I grew up in a family where my father is a professor of international relations, so our dinner table conversation always were centered on Western uh, philosophers and uh, Western political thought and Indian political thought. However, uh, when I was trying to branch out and work more uh, in a more focused manner on defense and nuclear policy issues, I was often told that uh, nuclear and defense is a technical uh, field and subject and not necessarily meant for women. Uh, for the last five years, I've been working in the sector and uh, making sure that uh, gender equities in some of these techni technical areas are much more uh, strengthened to, through work and spotlighting women's contribution and collaboration in this initiative. Thank you. I'll end that. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, wow, yeah, you're involved in, involved in a lot of different initiatives that are just really important and fundamental to um, uplifting the voices of women in your field. So that's really exciting. Um, and we look forward to hearing more from you. Um, and then we're going to turn to Kimmy for her, her to give us a little bit of background on her work as well. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. So formally introducing myself now, um, as Marian said earlier, my name is Kimmy Ma. I am a project associate with CRDF Global, and I work in the Strategic Trade Controls and Border Security Division. My background is actually in biology. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's in both molecular bio and Japanese and then went to a master's that tweaked towards the policy and security side in biohazards and emerging infectious diseases. Um, currently, my work at CRDF Global kind of combines work that is related to sanctions and trade controls, but I have been recently trying to put a spin on it that can combine my, my experience and expertise in biology and infectious diseases and COVID um with what we are currently doing here at the organization so i'm gonna just cut myself off right there um <laughs> and looking forward to the discussion today thank you kimmy for sharing um also really important field right now especially with uh what's going on in the world um so excited to hear more about your work um before we get into 
um, chapter one of the best practices guide and the content within, um, I have a special question that's directed at Patricia and Yvonne. Um, you both participated in the U.S. Department of State IVLP program, and more specifically, uh, you both participated in a professional exchange program called Hidden No More, empowering women, women leaders in STEM. Um, this three-week program explored ways to increase the participation of women and girls in STEM fields and examined how women contribute to economic growth while also allowing you to engage with scientists and engineers around the United States who support and mentor women in STEM. Can you talk a little bit more about your experience in this program and any connections you made or lessons learned that are relevant to our conversation today about navigating gender-based barriers in STEM? Um, I will start with um, Yvonne, why don't you start us off? Well, um... I'm in the second edition of uh, Hidden No More in 2018. Uh, I was, uh, I, I have to say, uh, was the most transforming and amazing program that I, I, I did. Um, this program uh, give us some tools to leadership, to mentoring, to reduce the gender gap in in a way most of our country in latin america that's uh first the old woman in science is not bigger number more in tech than uh, other other biomedical or art science uh, uh, fields but uh the other thing was was a really really beautiful about this program is that during three weeks uh 48 women from different country, different religion, different uh, language, can, uh, um, you know, be so tight, so like a, like a one, uh, one object or one people in, uh, under, or, or under this uh, umbrella of this program, Hidden No More. Was it really, really inspiring? Um, after two years, we'll keep in touch, all of us, um, and uh, really was a really transforming uh, program. We feel like a sisters. And uh, one thing that this kind of program uh, demonstrate is that no matter in what country you are, the problem are the same for women. The problem are the same. The gender gap, the, uh, the man's panel, uh, the man's planning, uh, all, all these things we share the same the same issues in our country until these days and that's is a you know our goal to try to reduce all these kind of things that are put inside the woman so uh, this program was the second edition in fact patricia the first edition so when uh, we watch the video that our sister from the program 2017 um uh, introduced for the this journal of three weeks was really really emotional more of us was crying and uh, and this is the the experience more beautiful in my life after my PhD degree and my kids the IVP program thank you so much um, it's really great to hear that you were able to connect with other women around the world uh, because I think that's Something that's really important in tackling these issues is that many women feel isolated um, in you know, their own sector or their own country, their own region. So being able to connect with others is um, very important in kind of problem solving and collaborating and just also creating a support network for each other. Um, so I'm really glad that you were able to have that experience. And I want to turn to Patricia because, as you mentioned, she was actually in the first group um, in 2017 that participated in this program. So she is an original um, Hidden No More participant, and I'd like to hear about your experience. Uh, well, yes, uh, actually, I totally in agree with what Yvonne has said. Uh, the idea of the Hidden No More was a really really inspiring really motivating experience i think one of the um, 
it was a bit challenging, I think, for everyone. We were the first generation and we, are, we were a big group. We were 48 women, each one from different countries. So for any exchange program, it is very challenging because it is a big group and also there is several uh, interculturality that has to be taken in account, the languages and all. Uh, but in the practice, it was like really nice because we were all like feeling like really um, identify it really, we can really relate to the experiences of each other. No matter if you are from, from India, from Bangladesh, or from Zimbabwe, or from Ecuador, or from any country, we were like all in agree that we were facing the same challenges, uh, the same, same problems also, but also that we were all somehow involved in reducing the gap, the gender gap in all countries. And you can find that something that was also uh, good to know is like, we were having also some uh, IVLP that were an example from London or from, from other countries that are supposed to be a little bit better in the, in the gender gap. But still, we, we are facing the same problems, the, a lot of the invisibilization, the lack of role models, the, um, the things of the stereotypes, that was another thing that we were talking about, like the problems and how we are facing on that and each one was also sharing the strategies because you know we all have strategies to overcome that kind of issues. So we were exchanging the experience, exchanging the, the, the experiences, um, knowing also the, at the personal level the stories of each one and how this also matters a lot because it's not only the gap on the, on the gender gap, but there is also a lot of the things in the intersectionality there is things of the of the ethnicity of the economical issues that are affecting at the same time and uh, that was like a really good moment to see that and then also the other part was very nice to make the connections and the several institutions we were visiting in the states when they have also addressing that in example it was some things in LA also in Florida where they have these programs that were connecting the young people with the universities to go in more in science and tech. That was also very nice because we saw that this one thing is the gender gap, but also for our countries, an example for, for Ecuador, we really need to, to develop more the science from the early stages. I mean, the high school is not really connected to science. So they were very nice uh, programs, programs uh, there in the, in the States, like promoting that part of science. And next, we still keep in touch with everyone, with all the countries. We have still a chat in common. Uh, we are like kind of following the paths and celebrating the success of any other, like, oh, okay, you are going. Even they have some of the, um, our colleagues there, like, they were really happy to know about this seminar, like saying, oh, well, but this, this is cool. And there is a, um, a hearing anymore from the next generation. So we are also very excited about the, all the success that are each of us and the, and the other IVLPs and the Hidden No More going and, and succeeding in general in science. So yeah, that was really nice experience, very motivating. Great, um, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And I'm really glad you brought up um, how you noticed that there needed to be more emphasis on kind of early education and exposure for girls. Um, and that that was something that you noticed particularly in your country, although I think many countries struggle with that um, because that's actually a topic that we're gonna cover today. Um, and so I'm actually gonna turn to Kimmy to introduce us to the best practices guide and talk about this lack of career knowledge and mentorship for girls who are trying to pursue careers in STEM. I needed to unmute myself. Um, thank you, Marianne. So as some background for those here who weren't able to attend the first webinar, the Best Practices Guide was a product written by Sylvia here, um, me and Kate Hewitt, in response to a demonstrated need for guidance on how organizations can create support for women in STEM and security fields. Um, the chapters and the format were based on research and patterns that we noticed um, in the notes that came out of a discussion roundtable from CRDF Global's Breaking Barriers event last year on International Women's Day. Um, so from the guide, we'll be discussing chapter one now, which as you can see here is regarding the lack of career knowledge and mentorship 
for women currently in or interested in STEM and security. Um, our research indicated to us that mentorship and finding a role model in any young woman's field of interest plays a really big factor in their knowledge of how to enter their field, stay in that field, advance in that field, et cetera. And the pipeline, so to speak, um, as I like kind of allude to here, often breaks down when those young girls and women are unsure of how to get to those positions or feel that they aren't fit or they don't belong there um, due to, for instance, a gender gap or a male dominated field. So with that, I'll pass it back to Marion so we can hear from the rest of the panelists on this topic. Uh, great, thank you, Kimmy. Um, so now that we've kind of been introduced to the content of chapter one, um, the lack of career knowledge and mentorship, um, I wanna get started with our first question for our speakers, which is, can you comment on whether you feel there is an absence of career knowledge or mentorship for girls and women um, who may be interested in the areas of STEM and national security? Um, I will, um, why don't we start with Sylvia? We haven't heard from you in a little while. Still grappling how to unmute myself. <laughs> Uh, so I just wanted to uh, take a moment and also recognize the very historic and proud moment that we are uh, going through and witnessing in the U United States uh, domestic politics over here. We have uh, the first black woman and uh, the first woman of South Asian heritage uh, nominated to run for one of the uh, highest national offices and uh, uh, nominated for being a Joe Biden's uh, running mate, right? So whilst going through uh, Twitter and also like following the new cycle, one of the things that really sharply stood out for me was the number of women talking about how representation matters and seeing someone like her, a person of color, running for such a, a a national office really makes a difference. So uh, I, I think this this idea of identification of uh, mentors or leaders at important um, and running for high of uh, offices is a really significant one. So I just wanted to uh, make a note of that. And uh, regarding the absence of uh, career knowledge or uh, mentorship, uh, whilst doing our uh, research for this report, one one thing that stood out and was rife in all comments was the lack of awareness of some of these disciplines existing out there. And, uh, and when we kind of interviewed and delved a little bit uh, deeper, we uh, figured most of uh, the uh, people uh, who are now experts, women experts in this uh, field, really did, did not have access to uh, distinguished experts who were uh, already in the field of so this has been a systemic uh, problem and uh, we came out with a number of recommendations what could be done to underscore and highlight the works of women in STEM so that younger uh, women professionals while uh, trying to pursue STEM or advance their careers in STEM do not uh, face a lack of access to mentorship. And we already have a number of organizations who are making a difference in this realm. I would allude, and our, uh, our report also alludes to the work that is being done by Girl Security, co-founded and led by Lauren Buter. She uh, does talk about and she engages a lot of young uh, school girls uh, who are able to access and have mentorship experiences uh, with a uh, like experts in the national security and STEM domain. So uh, essentially it is important to uh, make uh, resources available to young uh, girls right from the uh, starting. So, so I, I think I'll stop there and would look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, so let's turn to Patricia or Yvonne. Do you wanna address this question? Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to say like we have been working like a lot on, on trying to also to, to work on, on reduce this, these problems. Um, we have our um, Ecuadorian network of women in science, 
So in our, I'm a co-founder of the, of the network. Uh, we are actually involving about, about uh, 20 organizations and more than 100 women scientists um, in Ecuador, working in Ecuador or from Ecuador working abroad. And we were, uh, at the beginning, it was a first approach on making visible the profiles of women in science, uh, going not only in there is um, lower representation of women in science, but also that the women in science are not well recognized or not visible, or it is not recognized the work and the contributions we have made for science. So we have started to working more on making visible the roles, making visible also the, the local roles. So uh, the girls and, and young women have more role models that looks more like them because also we know that this is more inspiring also when you see someone that is just like you and is doing science and it's okay i can also do that um, and then there is also some activities we have started to do beyond the visibilization so an example is uh, in our organization we try to keep an horizontal uh, organization with some course in each university and going around the, the country. So each one is also better addressing the needs in the locality, not only for the national level, but also because each, each place has its own needs, its own specific conditions. So uh, we have also our course and also making workshops with young people. Um, we have also some strategies very about events we organize around the 11th February, which is the International Day for the Girls and Women in Science. This is a really, really nice, nice day. So we have just connected activities from that day till the 8th of March, that's the International Day of Women. And we're making several events all around six weeks, like go in workshops, go in, in panels. Uh, we also have some exhibitions. Uh, this year was particularly nice. We have made, um, for the 8th of March, we make an exhibition where we have some posters of several scientists, national Ecuadorian scientists, uh, making a little bit on their path and what they are doing, particularly in areas where we know there is low representation, like ocean areas or informatics or maps. Only thing is we open it on the 8th of March and then we got on the lockdown the 17th of March, but we have to, to reopen it after pandemia found some virtual strategy. And well, we can talk a little bit more on, on, other, on other strategies, but I just want to highlight uh, the work that is also made uh, with children. We have some workshops and in, in engagement with other institutions that go uh, trying to train and open that for girls, an example for robotics or for chemistry. So they start early to get contact with science and addressing some other aspects that are more basic, like an example, um, situations of sex harassment that we know that is happening in some universities. So, and of course that is also affecting the development of a career in STEM. So, uh, ah yes, that is very nice. What are you projecting there is like your international, is a mix, but actually the ones you saw below is an international seminar we organize each year, except this year. Uh, going on promoting this is international one. We have national and Latin American um, participants and also we have arrived to engage or network with other Latin American networks, like in example, the ones from Colombia, from Chile, from Peru, that are also starting to have the, the scientist networks for, for humans. So again, we can take more about it, but I don't want to monopolize the mic. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you have a lot of different avenues that you're pursuing um, in terms of like uplifting both um, like girls and mentoring them and creating programs for them, but also highlighting um, adult women that are active in the field and their contributions and making that more visible so that girls are seeing those role models and, you know, they're, they're seeing themselves, like you said, um, and that's a source of inspiration for them. Um, I'm going to turn to Yvonne and see what she's been doing and um, her thoughts on this issue. Yeah, um, I think it's the same problem in our country that um, in some points, the girls and uh, women 
can I have the access for a good mentorship or have a role model to follow and start the, end, the, the STEM career? But uh, since 20 years ago, our, our governments uh, have an endeavor to increase the number of PhD uh, degree in Panama. And they send a lot of people uh, to other university and, and outside uh, Panama and other other uh, country and return, and that that ca cause an effect in our in our thinking and our critical thinking in our our young people. Um, they increase our real role models, uh, men and women, and that's create. A, a great uh, opportunity to increase a more robotic fear, a science fear, a project, a, you know, a, with a kids in the school, kids in the high school, and increase the number of, of masters in our universities. But at the same time, the number of mentors uh, increase because uh, we already know that the, the, the young people need a guidance to follow uh, a career if they want to do something in science. And uh, this la the lack of uh, mentorship uh, don't help uh, to the develop of the country in the science area. Uh, other things is very important is the difference between the, the engineer, math and tech versus uh, biomedicines or traditional career in science. There are less number of women in engineers on a tech career than, uh, than uh, medicine or other, other science field. And uh, in the last years, uh, we try to increase uh, the number of women in code or women in engineer, or women in robotic, um, because um, two years ago, our country making a study about this woman in science fields, and uh, we see different phenomena. Uh, one, the scissor phenomenon is, uh, you know, there are a lot of women in bachelor, but decrease uh, if you um, go to master's degree or PhD degree or a director for an institute or, you know, a head or the power position in a science field, uh, contrary to the, to the men. Um, and that this was an awareness. And one thing that Patricia said is about the awareness about more women in science. Is something that 20 years ago our country didn't realize that, that we need more women in science. And uh, nowadays uh, we can see more women in uh, science in televisions or papers or, or magazines that increase the visibilization of the, our work in science like women. Um, thank you so much, Yvonne. I quickly just want to um, highlight the PowerPoint slide that's up because I think you both kind of mentioned some of um, these initiatives um, and we didn't have the slide up yet, but um, Patricia, if you quickly want to address um, the two, like there's um, a topic on manuals, on monitoring and tagging um, with Panal de Hombres, and then um, another initiative that you're working on. I think they're really interesting and um, it'd be great for our attendees to hear a little bit more. Uh, yeah, thank you, Marion. Uh, well, basically the things with the manos, uh, and we have been using this hashtag, Panel de Hombres, which is basically the same idea when we have the panels that are made by only male or the majority of males. And that is, a, that is a problem that has been analyzed before. And there's also some nice article by Sylvia, who I was reading the last week, also addressing the problem uh, because there is uh, a way where we are sending a wrong message that only men are experts or only men are, have a, an important voice. And it was normally a problem that we, we know it, it was happening, but now, considering the, the COVID pandemic and everyone is in the, in the lockdown and we are spending more 
time, more hours behind the computers, it was really uh, unexpected how it was pricing. So we have a lot of more of these models each day. It's like we were at the beginning not searching for them, but it was just, you know, appearing in your timeline. You're going to see things and suddenly it was like popping, popping a lot of these models. So we start just to first monitoring them and just putting the tag, okay, this is a, a panel de hombres, a manel. So why you don't check with the experts? We have experts. So there is also, um, they start in Spanish. They have also another hashtag that is no sin ellas. That meaning is like not without uh, them or without women. Um, going is particularly in some areas, like an example, uh, subjects like we are having a panel about inclusion and you're having a manual. So it was like, how you can talk about inclusion with a no diverse panel? And the other uh, initiative, well, the, what you have there is also what just to highlight, we were making also a quest to see how is the percentage. Another thing we want to highlight is the, about the pandemia, we take three main subjects about COVID itself and education and on research. And what we saw is the women were less uh, invited to be speakers. However, they are accounting for the most of the public. So there is also another problem there because we are in the public. You have a lot of experts in the public, but you are not uh, letting them to speak. And this is also a negative impact on the knowledge because we also know now that the science, the most diverse, the better the quality of science. So it's not just because of the inclusion, but because, because of the quality of the information. And the other initiative, the one that is the hashtag, eres más que un espectador, uh, meaning somehow like you are more than just an observer, is a project that it was developed uh, from our network, from Ramsey. This is the, the acronym of our network. And it was Marcela and Mabel actually who were driving this project that was in a, um, a joint effort with the UK Embassy and the University of Liverpool. Like we were, they were working in the universities, making these kind of workshops, trying to prevent. If this is not, not only in the, the nose of the sexual harassment that is happening at the universities, but also going in the education and the consciousness, not only placing the responsibility on women, but in all the people around saying like, if you see something, do something. Basically is that the, the basis. If you see harassment, you say, it. because we also know that in an environment when you have sexual harassment, it is really almost impossible to develop a successful career on science or in general in any career. So it was really going also something that is more more complicated and that we're more urgent even that bridging the gap in sciences. Thank you so much um, for introducing us to those initiatives. Um, I think those both inclusion and um, sexual harassment are issues that a lot of women face, not just in um, STEM, but also in like most career paths. And so it's important to highlight them and not just what we as women can do, but also what our male colleagues can do, like you said, in speaking up and pointing out um, when that's happening. Um, I just want to go back real quick, Kimmy, um, because I wanted Yvonne to talk a little bit about those pictures and um, some of the mentorship efforts she's working on, and then we'll move to our first Q&A session. Okay, well, in this uh, picture, you, we can see um, two girls that uh, was uh, my mentee uh, during a fair, um, science fair uh, in high school, and they won in that year uh, the prize for representing Panama in the area of medicine. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the program that have with our Secretary National of Science Technology uh, about a uh, you know, young research, young scientists. So they develop a, a project during a, a, during a, a year, and the end of the year they present uh, in a fair, and they just uh, give you a, a, a qualification and a prize. Finally, my 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 team won. Um, but other other strategy uh, we had is a camp. A science and technology camp. Uh, during a week, we uh, you know join a, a group of kids 
in, in the, from high school, and we developed uh, a camp, a science camp about it, a, a subject. And this year in January, before the pandemic time, <laughs> we can uh, able to develop a, a, a science and technology camp about, about agriculture. And we uh, uh, joined um, around 13 kids from uh, 14 years old until 17 years old during a week. And they uh, can develop uh, a project uh, according to their skills in agriculture. And uh, we tried that the group was uh, half girls and half men to, you know, the, the term of equity. Uh, we try to incentive uh, to motivate this kind of uh, cooperation, collaboration with the, the kids and see like it's an equal to your peer. Was a beautiful uh, activity. The mostly of the kids was the interior of a country that so they came to the city to the capital of the the country and share during a week. Uh, they um, have a housing in an hotel and they have all these uh, commodities for a week with, uh, with a lot of food because, uh, you know, the teenagers uh, <laughs> eat a lot. And we say really funny and uh, enjoyed this time with the kids and other scientists, women and men, then uh, it's uh, like the, the image of role model, so the mentoring. So that kind of activity in doing these last years helped us to increase the STEM profession or STEM career in or, or, or people, in, in, in the young people. It's an, it's an a step, it's one step. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Yeah, I think it's really important to create activities and events like that um, where like younger generations can see that, yeah, science is hard. It, 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 requires a lot of hard work and study, but it can also be fun. And so finding ways to pick their curiosity and get them engaged, um, like camp or like science um, fairs is a great way to do that, especially early on. Uh, so thank you for sharing. Um, I know that we are getting questions in um, from the webinar attendees and they're eager to hear your responses. So um, we're gonna go to our first Q&A session. Um, so I will start with the first question, which is, how do we address the myth that women in science or any other um, it says tedious field find it difficult to get married and that science is very difficult? Um, I will leave it up to the panelists of who wants to address this question. Um, yeah, I, I will go on this one. Uh, it was like, um, okay, that is true that is, there is that perception, that perception and the stereotype, like the typical when you say like how you imagine a scientist and it's not like people is also imagine like you have to be really smart, like basically a genius, but also the, the stereotype that normally a scientist is a male and normally it's a white male. So considering that and, and, and that we know also that for so long science has been a little bit distant, like we have no that thing saying like the, the ivory tower. Uh, we are more aware now of that and working on, working on the next generation, on the girls and the young people in general, like just showing up like people in science is diverse. It is, Difficult can be, it is hard, but it is not impossible. It is basically about patience, about dedication, about like embracing uncertainty also. Uh, but basically it's more like, like that condition, like um, there is a lot of, of things that are going and the stereotypes that are not true. Just think about the coding. The first coders in the world were women. And then suddenly when the career was more profitable, it started to be changing on a more male dominated field. But it's not like it was originally like that, like a lot of informatics, like the first computers, I mean, person computers were also females that was also with the hidden, the hidden figures and that was the one that was inspiring our, our IBLP program. 
And then another thing about the, the science, like the women are not getting married in science. Uh, we got married. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is not really a limitation in the practical. But the other, uh, I just have seen recently at the talk by Chamanda, this, this uh, writer, and I found it really, really clear what she said about like, sometimes the idea is like you cannot get married because uh, men are, can perceive you like intimidating or they can be like afraid of you. And what she said was something like, um, that is not really a problem because you don't really want to be to someone that is intimidated because of your success, because of your intelligence. So it's basically like, um, and I, I think that this is for all women is, you are not really trading with your future of your personal care. We have to work a lot to get the balance, it's true. But it doesn't mean that you have to, to quit your personal life to be in STEM or in any other career. I guess maybe Yvonne also have uh, some, some impressions on that and on her experience. Um, there's something always I, I, I thought during my PhD degree is uh, if I can or could able to do my PhD degree before my kids, uh, it was a bit different. And after all these years, uh, I conclude that doesn't matter when you do it, whatever you want to do, is you really want to do and you are passionate about that. So it's true there are a stereotype about what means be scientists or um, that the, the, the fact that women is not the first image that comes in on your mind is you think about the scientists. So uh, the personal life and the, or professional life is true. In some point, needs a balance, but in, it's, it's, it's something real that maybe sometimes we can handle it. And we do everything because re, we're really passionate about our career, about our, our, our goals. And at the end, I saw that like an example for my kids. I have two kids, a woman, a, a girl, and a boy. And uh, they can see all my effort to take my, or to my, my, my goals, my, my PhD degree, my work, try to be success. But more than that, try to be a, a, good, a good person. Uh, you know, help people that need help, uh, support women, because women supporting women, this is uh, the, the best way to help or, or, or gender, to reduce the gender gap. And uh, at the end, the, the countries, uh, so there are differences in our countries, but the, 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 these issues or the problems are the same. Have to be, uh, uh, to be awareness about or, or difference in, in, in terms of uh, gender, but it's not a handicap. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a way to work harder and appreciate our goals. But that's the other problem because sometimes the women feel that they don't deserve that, that, uh, that be success. And it's not true. We deserve that and more. And we have to go for that. This is my, my, my opinion. Thank you both um, so much for answering that question and um, sharing your input. Um, we're going to answer one more before moving on to the next section of the webinar. Um, so this one, I believe, is directed towards Sylvia. It says, Sylvia mentions a lack of access to expert mentorship in the field. Does she mean no or limited access at all or no access to female expert mentors or women of color? Um, so I think they're asking you to kind of specify what you meant by that statement, Sylvia. Uh, hi, uh, so thank you for the question. I think what I was trying to uh, get at is that right from the start or when uh, like younger girls are in their high schools, uh, they do not necessarily have access or like um, or um, 
uh, connections with uh, women experts who are already in the field um, and who are uh, working in STEM and national security um, career. So when I um, when I say lack of access, I, I think like I'm trying to elaborate on uh, the fact that we essentially, that whilst there are role models, we do not necessarily uh, like, you know, talk about them or amplify their work um, in our report or something that we um, mentioned repeatedly and that kind of runs through the sinews of the report is the fact that women's contribution in science and national security in STEM fields are often overlooked, historically has been often overlooked, and we have not done a good job in uh, incorporating uh, scientific innovations and experiments uh, done by uh, women experts and scientists in our um, school books. So right from the uh, very beginning, we see a systemic bias against not underscoring or highlighting or bringing to forth uh, the contribution of women in uh, science and technology. And therefore, so this essentially uh, creates the lack of uh, visible mentors. Uh, it's not that we do not already have uh, a number of uh, women who are contributing and uh, like you know, pushing the envelope further uh, in this domain. It's just that we are unable, we have not done a really good job in terms of highlighting their contribution. And that is why it is so essential to incorporate uh, their contribution in school textbooks so that we are right from uh, the very beginning training younger girls that uh, they, they should be pursuing uh, careers in STEM. And uh, it, is, uh, it is, of course, uh, uh, difficult, but it is something that they should not be shy away from exploring. Thank you, Sylvia, um, for elaborating on what you meant by that. And I think Kimmy wanted to hop in here um, and say something real quick. Yeah, um, there was something that, like kind of in that question that I thought about, that was worth mentioning is that um, I'm going to hazard a guess and I think most of the people on this webinar are most likely women or like aspiring women in STEM and security. But I do hope that if there are any men on this webinar or if you have male colleagues that you encourage them to use their voice to help highlight say for instance women's contributions or to use their voice in a way that if they have a, like a mentee who is a woman and is looking for role models or people in their fields, that if they don't have the connections to help them make the connections. Because I think something that is happening right now is this division between um, like women's networks and men's networks. But in reality, men can help facilitate the growth of women's networks. And I think that's an idea that isn't seen very often because it's sometimes like like two-sided, like you can't be on both. Um, so this is just something that I want to encourage everyone to consider a little bit. Ourselves, we also need the help of our um, male counterparts in kind of bringing attention to our own contributions and um, what we're doing as well. Um, so now we are going to move on to another chapter of the best practices guide. Um, and so we're going to turn to Sylvia, who's going to talk about the content of chapter three, which focuses on inflexible career parameters. Uh, Sylvia, take it away. Thank you, Marian. Uh, so uh, right at the outset, I just wanted to mention uh, for our report, we had we followed a, a uniform uh, research methodology, of which was essentially uh, two pronged. Uh, first, we conducted interviews. Uh, we uh, met a number of uh, women experts in STEM and national security, and uh, we were extremely uh, privileged uh, because they gave us their time and uh, gave us uh, their inputs and opinion. And then the second. Uh, uh, what we followed was uh, doing a survey of a lot of literature, uh, both uh, like looking at uh, scientific contributions and incorporating uh, them in our report.
about and also uh, what some of the uh, corporates are doing or some of the NGOs uh, in the sector are doing. So by uh, doing this, what uh, like the three broad points that we uh, essentially came uh, and we tried to highlight that in our uh, chapter was one, that it is correct that women value career flexibility more than they value salary. So a lot of the studies that we surveyed essentially gave us numbers which indicated that women are more uh, uh, sensitive or attentive about uh, like flexibility in their work uh, space vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the salary uh, component. And by saying that, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, participants who uh, who gave us time for this study indicated that uh, the responsibilities that women had were disproportionately uh, skewed, and some uh, and some things that uh, the men would not be able to undertake. For example, child rearing, uh, birth, uh, child birthing, and also breast uh, feeding and uh, related uh, issues uh, to family planning. So uh, women had um, a lot of um, like, um, I, I would say, um, experiences in terms of family uh, planning which were not necessarily uh, had to uh, like could be burden shared essentially with their male counterparts and that is why uh, career flexibility or flexibility uh, at their work uh, space is essentially something that uh, was extremely vitally important uh, to women. Uh, we um, highlighted this one study uh, which uh, it's called the mom project which uh, and the numbers indicated that 86% of women who uh, pursue STEM career after marriage or uh, after the um, uh, family uh, planning process, they are unable to uh, uh, pursue uh, uh, STEM career because of the demanding work hours, the inflexible work hours and extremely uh, stringent uh, kind of work environment. So um, it, it, since um, we are unable to retain um, a large portion of women who are working in the uh, STEM field after a uh, family um, and like a uh, family planning, we came up with the certain specific recommendations that would really um, encourage everyone to take a look at our report, which essentially ask corporates to in include like flexible work parameters and policies uh, in their um, in their corporate uh, policy. So as for us to better retain the mid-career uh, scholars and experts of uh, women in uh, STEM and national security. I'll, I'll stop uh, at that and I would really uh, look forward to uh, hearing from our panelists how uh, they have straddled uh, working in the field and uh, managing their, uh, uh, their family uh, life. Uh, Thank you, Sylvia, um, for introducing us to that chapter and the content that's kind of covered there. And I do believe um, that Yvonne and Patricia kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, but our first question in regards to this content is, have you or people you know felt restricted by your workplace environment or felt forced to choose between your job and other areas of your life? Um, we can start out with Yvonne. In some point of my 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 career, when I was uh, pregnant, um, uh, I I have to decide to quit for one of my job because in that that time I have two job, uh, and I have to decide to quit uh, from one job uh, and maintain more time for my my child and uh, for all the the things that uh, is around the, the baby that changed their, their life. Um, but um, is I'm not forced for the external issues, I force it for myself. But I know in others' others' works, I, I know that people have to choose between the, the career or between uh, uh, raise the kids during the, the first years of the life of the, the kids. Um, yeah, the second thing in my life, I, I already talked about that, when I went uh, to my PhD degree in other country in Spain, I have to bring with me one of my child, the, the youngest, because uh, um, I have to pursue that, that, that goal um, 
was a really, really hard. Um, we need uh, help. And that, that is the other, the other issue. What, that is the condition around the women that have babies. What is the role of your, your couple? Does it really help you? Uh, and that is, that's things make a difference about uh, what are the end of the, all these things you can get. That is that's my, my personal experience in this field. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, Patricia, did you want to comment at all on this question? Uh, yes, and in addition, I would like to say that uh, in my experience and what I have seen and, and live about that is uh, there is a lot of expectations about women. So there is one thing about expectation. There is not only the limitations of the work that is not allowing you to to make a compatibility between your, your personal life, if you have children and the work, but also the expectation that women must be the perfect mothers, uh, that they should be the one that have to take care of the children. And that is a kind of expectations that sometimes that we also have on ourselves, like you have to take care of the family, of the people. And I think this is kind of the, the hard thing, like when you decide, because it has to be a decision, like, okay, we are, we are splitting uh, our responsibilities on, on the domestic responsibilities, not only the, the care of children, of the, of the people, of the um, elders at home. Uh, that in one side. And on the other side, there is also the expectations I have found and the women must be mothers, and you have to, to justify if you don't want to be a mother. And that also happened in the, in the work, and I have an impression because people also have that expectation that it's not a question like, nobody asks a woman why they have children, but they ask why you don't have children. And in the case of men, even they are not asking simply <laughs> about it. So that is what I, I see that something we really have to work on is in really, uh, it, we, we don't have first, we have to be empowered enough, like to know like it is not a responsibility to answer the expectation, the external expectations. But then the other thing also taking on the public, like there is not their, their position to have expectations on, on a women and how they should manage or how we should manage our, our personal arrangements and our, our work. Uh, also because that drives you like an example, I have been in interviews like not so many years ago, like where the first question they make is not about my qualifications, but if I'm expecting to have children in the near future. So it's like kind of, um, that kind of things, we are still having that. And in our case, in our country, it's not forbidden. I know that in some countries, actually, it is, it is illegal to ask for that. But here not, and it's quite common that they ask you before asking for your credentials or the classical things like how you will manage a complex situation or how you think you are a fit for this job. It came with that thing like, are you planning to have children? How many children do you plan to have in the next five years? So that kind of things like, I think that is a lot of on the on the conceptions and the misconceptions that we really have to make a lot of work yes, on, on this kind of the family life and the work life. Marin, I quickly wanted to uh, jump in and uh, kind of uh, like, you know, taking off uh, from uh, the points that both uh, like all the three uh, panelists mentioned. I think it is important to underscore that we are actually going through an unprecedented moment uh, globally uh, with the work from home fo format. And suddenly uh, it has come into uh, like, you know, a sharper notion that a lot of the work and uh, burden sharing when it comes to like uh, deliverables can be done. Uh, from within the comforts and confines of your uh, home. So given lockdown, there has been some positives about this global uh, kind of lockdown situation. And we see that a lot of the work and deliverables can be done from, uh, from our 
home. So I, I feel going ahead, uh, governments um, and uh, corporates uh, uh, globally should be able to recognize this fact and have uh, some inbuilt uh, flexible policies towards uh, like, you know, women or even uh, like in terms of uh, both uh, like uh, men and women who are able or want access to parental leave and things like that. So I, I think like the work from home format has exposed us to some of the possibilities of what could be done uh, having a more um, uh, like flexible work structure. Thank you, Sylvia, for jumping in there. Um, I th we have one more question that we're going to get to in the same um, topic of Chapter 3. Um, and so that question is, have you ever felt that girls and women in your field are excluded from certain work settings, projects, or activities because of stereotypes about your gender and professional capacity? Um, I'll leave this open for whoever wants to answer. So, um, uh, yes, uh, it was for me it was going to be like very, very punctual on this uh, because actually there are um, several com very specific things you have in the oceanic field. So first thing that there is a work or, or an area of work and research that for years women were banned. Like historically, they were even thought to be bad luck to have a woman on board. And now we are in a better time that we know there is no giving bad luck on that. But we are still having some example. When I finished my, my career, uh, I was interested to be an observer and the tuna ships. So there is an international commission that is in, in charge of doing that is an international program. But actually the thing like was, uh, when I tried to apply, they were like, the position is only for men. And that was like just a statement like that. There is nothing you can do about that. It should be uh, for men. And not because of the strength or because of the technical issues, but because the argument is like, they can not ensure your safety going on board during three months in a, in a ship that is full only of men. So that was like, like really irrational because it's like you cannot be with, all, with a ship with only men because something is going to happen and that will be somehow your responsibility. And okay, that can be, we can say like, okay, yeah, but that was like 15 years ago. The problem is like uh, now when I came back to Ecuador, I have found uh, I'm working in a, in a faculty that is some marine sciences. So they have one of the careers is biology in fisheries. And I have found some uh, graduates, some, some biologists that they say to me like, they are still having that with the same institution and they are still banned for having that. When on the other side, we know an example in the program that is in the, Atl in the Atlantic, you have women observers. So it's not like it's impossible to have it. We have another examples, but here is becoming a still like really hard and this simply because they are women. Uh, even you have that kind of still of, of expectations, like saying, like, why you, why you want to go in a boat, in a boat on a ship full of men? And it's like, it's not that, but you want to do a job that is really interesting on the other, on the other hand. And the other thing is like, sometimes you have um, this kind of precisions and that is becoming like complicated in the format, what they are expecting because of the stereotypes. Um, Example, uh, for example, and when we do field work in biology, and uh, when I was, before when I was younger, I was doing a lot of field work. I have a lot of the expectations that they underestimate you. Like an example, when I was working with my marine iguanas in Galapagos, uh, at the beginning, they were like thinking, I cannot handle the animals. It's like, uh, you cannot be strong enough because you're women, but at the same time, if you can handle that, it's like, there is too much strength for a woman. So these are kind of, of stereotypes that this uh, complicate to have the balance and in the case of marine sciences and the works in the field work, I think we have also a lot, a lot to change and being conscious that women can do one thing is like women and girls are a lot more strong, they're stronger than we thought about. And the other thing is that they're very capable to do any kind of work in a boat, in a ship, in the field and 
and also in the highly demanding skill works. Uh, thank you so much, Patricia. I feel like there's a lot of assumptions, like you're saying, about what women are capable of. And um, I think that goes for intellectually what we're capable of, but also physically that there's a lot of, like you said, that, oh, we won't be able to keep you safe or um, you can't keep yourself safe, right? These decisions are being made for women um, without any consultation from women themselves about what they're capable of or what they feel comfortable um, so I think that's definitely an active battle for many women around the world and kind of dispelling those assumptions. Um, Yvonne, did you want to answer this question? Definitely. Um, in case of Patricia was, uh, you know, the feel of the, her job, but in academic things, uh, something I, uh, I can observe is a position of power, like, uh, you know, the president of the university or vice president of the university in, in the last year is the only man. Um, these kind of issues in, a, in an academic institution is a the wrong message for the society. And uh, in some case, I, I ask why there are done a vice president at least, because in my university, the president of the university is by election. But all these things, all these systems uh, is uh, working for men, not for women, uh, because there are, you know, brotherhood more than uh, uh, other things. And if women pursue a position of power, uh, they, they can find any, you know, excuse to minimize, to, do, uh, to be a side of uh, that career. And uh, another thing is uh, for being a, a man in power, you know, there, there are, have a few, you know, fissures uh, for that position. But the woman need or woman feel that I have to fool to feel all that that uh, that condition to be uh, a, a boss chief. But the other other thing uh, additional is uh, if you um, speak aloud about all this issue, they say you're emotional. What does it mean? What does it mean be emotional? If you uh, you know confront the issues, the facts, and uh, you're passionate about that, yeah, you're emotional. And uh, that's kind of thing I, I can, uh, you know, um, see in my academic career more than um, other, other field because, uh, because I surrender about men boss more than women was. And that, time, that thing we have to change. Definitely, it, it, that help the awareness and this kind of forum, the kind of panel. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, I feel like, yes, one, assuming that we're more emotional than men is um, a misguided assumption, but also even if someone was emotional, assuming that that is a bad thing and that there's no place for that, I think is also misplaced assumption um, and really just negates um, the benefits of being emotional and being a communicator and how important that is in both our personal and professional lives. Um, so I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, we are getting short on time. It's 124, so we have about six minutes left. We'd like to open it up um, for the last Q&A section for the attendees. Um, we do have some questions from the last section that didn't get entered. Um, so I'm going to refer to one of those first. Um, it says, why do you think the percentage decreased to 42%? I think it is caused by discrimination and doubt women face when pursuing their careers. Um, I'd like to know what others think. So I think this person is asking about one of the um, statistics we, we showed in a previous slide about the percentage of women um, pursuing careers um, decreasing with age. So I'll leave it open to whoever wants to address this question. I think that there's something I mentioned before that when there are, we're younger in our career, there are a lot of, of, of women that 
finish the degree, but when the when the, the pass of the time, when you get a master or a PhD degree, the number of the candidate of women reduce. And uh, um, in some studies here, I, I, I imagine in other countries, is a part for the that the personal life of the women that have more responsibility at home, not only to family, but uh, if there are uh, younger brother or sister, they are elderly people living with her, she take that, uh, that work for her. So there are no time to get uh, more study or to work more harder than already did because they, they don't have enough time to, to, to do that. And that's the problem. That's is a social problem because we have lack of public, uh, politics, public, for public politics for, for help women that need to, to have help from home for kids or for elderly or in case of uh, poverty or uh, less economic income. All that, all those things are handled. That the number of women in in other part of the education decrease more than that, and on college and postgraduate career, and and so. Um, I can quickly jump in on this. Um, so I I think uh, it is a terrific question, and also uh, like the answer kind of lies within the question. Yes. A large part of it is due to uh, discrimination. Uh, when we were uh, doing uh, this uh, report, one of the things that uh, that was um, like that importantly came out was retention in the field was a challenge, and uh, all the panelists uh, like today referred to the different uh, challenges that women face, why they are or they are unable to continue and uh, continue advancing. Uh, their careers and uh, like uh, the mid-career challenge is a big one and retain retention of uh, the mid-career experts is a even greater one and hence I think uh, like government agencies and uh, federal contractors and corporates needs to come up with better policies which are able to retain uh, these uh, great uh, talents in their uh, mid-careers. However, uh, saying uh, that, I think uh, one point uh, that uh, I know uh, Kimi alluded to before is allyship. And it is extremely important to have allies both organizationally and outside your work structure, which essentially is or helps uh, women in certain ways to combat and uh, feel more strengthened uh, to uh, keep on pursuing the good fight despite uh, these challenges of discrimination that women uh, face at each and every uh, level. Saying that, I in uh, one of my concluding remarks, I just wanted to highlight the fact that if if a society is unable to harness the benefits of uh, from and in like the uh, the the half of their population which is like uh, women in the stem and national security sector eventually that society is able or is going to lose out on competitiveness in the long run in the global arena and that's why it's extremely important that uh, the uh, like the societies and uh, struck government and corporate structures should be able to harness uh, the benefits uh, that uh, women uh, experts bring uh, in uh, these uh, field and um, and highlighting uh, their work is essential. We have uh, in our report spoken about the like the bi bias to citations like women are often not cited in uh, in papers in academic journals in a uh, newspaper article so uh, citation bias is one more challenge along with panels and spotlighting work only done by men uh, is something that we have to effectively call out at each and every step i'll stop at that i just have one more small thing to add in sorry i know we're like really at time right now um, one of the, like something recently that I heard is it's kind of a sad but funny anecdote is that for one of the first women who went into space as an astronaut, they did not bother asking her, say for instance, how many tampons she needed or like period products she needed for her, her week. 
Instead, they just estimated. And so she went into space with an atrocious number of 100, which, okay, fine, she has a lot of storage, but the issue is, is the fact that conversations surrounding this stuff is seen as like shameful or weak or bothersome. And instead, the dialogue has to just become more inclusive. Like this is a natural part of life, you know, otherwise none of us would be here. Um, and so this is systemic, but also like one by one, we can change kind of how we address conversations like that. And it'll change the culture as well for future generations. Yeah, I just want to, to mention, uh, I completely agree uh, about the, the statements before, uh, particularly about the, the social silence, about biological aspects that are typical of women. We know that it's also affecting on the medical aspects, like in example, several experiments, several drugs were tested only in male. And now we know that they were not working in the same way in women. So that is also something that we have to, to address. And also highlighting about the, even for the or, or initiative that I mentioned before for the manners we're doing from our network, uh, we have had some reactions about that by saying like, well, if, if there is not an invitation, maybe it's because there is not enough women experts. So we have started also to go on a more uh, propositive aspect like showing we have. And I think one uh, aspect that was very uh, successful to, to strengthen this initiative uh, is our networking. Like we are starting to connect with a lot uh, of other women from other areas of science. So we were really able to propose names on experts for different panels, for different areas. And maybe that is why we have that drop of the 42% because previously it's like uh, men tend to have more like how Yvonne say like like the brotherhood and you're keeping that when you're going for a professional path but the kind of women were lacking that we are not we were not really generating that kind of professional networks during our development of our careers so when that it matters that is going for the director places uh, it was not having that kind of support from a strong network or a group or other colleagues and that is kind of the thing that we are changing now with this kind of initiatives that was doing the IBLP, like really strengthening the connections around the world, not only because uh, within their countries, but around the world. So we are stronger together, basically, is that we are advancing more on that way. So thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, you all just had such amazing things to say, and I hate to cut the conversation short because this is such an engaging dialogue, um, but we are a little bit over time. So I wanna wrap things up really quickly. Um, thank you so much to everyone in attendance. It's great to see you all here um, having these conversations and engaging on these topics. Um, we will be having a follow-up breakout session to this event on Thursday, August 27th from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern um, Daylight Time. And that will basically be a more open forum where people can talk about what we've been talking about today um, and be able to engage um, and speak and just rather than like a webinar panel format. So we'd love to see you there. Um, our next slide has a list of resources um, for each speaker, their articles, social media, um, videos about their work. And so we will send out this slide deck to all attendees um, after the event so that you can learn more about what they're involved in um, and connect with them on social media. Um, and I just want to close out uh, saying thank you again to everyone, um, to our wonderful speakers, to the International Visitors Council of Los Angeles, and of course, CRDF Global for making this event possible. Um, be well, and we hope to see you at the breakout session on the 27th. And we'll also send a recording of this event um, next week with the resources and the slide deck. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Take care. And thank you for you everyone who attended. And I, I thought the conversation was very interactive. The chat and the Q&A box were always full. So thank you so much uh, to CRDF and for everyone who attended this event. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hope to see you all soon. See you soon. See you. Bye. Bye.